link in with coral reefs or ecosystem restoration. And I will, given that I'm here with aquaculture, automatically assume that there's a role for aquaculture and ecosystem restoration, but I'm very hesitant to say what that role is because it's a rather sensitive topic. Whenever you mention the word aquaculture, most people either have a very negative impact or approach to that. Some people stop and think. A few people think it's a good thing. So, so it's a dangerous topic to walk around, but I think what we can get out of this presentation is that there's a very strong toolbox that aquaculture has that we can use if we want to, to deal with some of the things we've heard about. You know, and the word herbivore just stands out. If there's a herbivore thing, give you some herbivores. You know, what you do with those herbivores is very tricky. But if we're at the point in this whole process where things aren't going very well, and there are a whole lot of reefs that simply aren't going to be you know, restored naturally, should we intervene? That's a hard thing to decide on, but we have the tool to allow people to intervene. Okay, aquaculture, and I like this picture because it's got big things in it. Aquaculture is about big things. It's about big fish, big cages, big production. And it's normally used for seafood supply. So aquaculture is one of the major producers of seafood, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. But it's also already used in ecosystem restoration. And I'll give you some examples of local um, applications of aquaculture here, close to Canberra, before I go on to what we could potentially try and achieve if we wanted to in a coral reef system. Um, you know, things like restocking are obvious. Restoration is something that we can try and approach. And they all link into coastal livelihoods. You know, it's very nice for us to stand here in Canberra or we'll live in Australia with the Great Barrier Reef beside us, but not think about what's happening in Southeast Asia and in all these other countries. Now, I'm not a coral reef biologist, but when I think about coral reef restoration, that's where my mind automatically goes, and that's where I see that some of the tools I'm going to talk about could become really, really useful. Okay, what does aquaculture do? Well, aquaculture replaces fisheries in many instances. And, yeah, there's a lot of argument about this, but basically now... Aquaculture provides around about 40 to 50% of the world's seafood. We eat 106 million tonnes of food fish. We did in 2004, and I hate to see what we've got now. 60 million tonnes of that came from the sea, from capture fisheries, and that's been static since 1980. So there's been no change given you know, what's going on with different species. Aquaculture supplies the other 46 million tonnes. Okay, so it's providing 43%. Now, to do that, it's actually at a very high technological level. It's not chopping up bait fish and throwing them into little cages, um, as some people think. It has a very, very serious set of scientific principles that it works to, and most high-level first-world aquaculture has a partnership with most non-government organisations and government organisations to ensure that it's environmentally sustainable. It's a business proposition. It has to meet those criteria if it's going to function in the long term. So I think we can take those rules and principles and try and use them in an intervention sense with a business function to try and at least help with restoration if we need to. OK. I think the Murray-Darling system is a very nice place to start because it's probably the best example in Australia of something that's not looking so well that suffers a multitude of problems that's very well understood, well researched, but where aquaculture actually has a clearly defined role. So I'll run through that quickly, and then I'll try and move over to coral reefs, where small things are happening, but the potential for large-scale intervention, you know, the scale of millions of urchins, the scale of millions of herbivores, is quite possible. Not in the future, but now. You, know, you could go to a business and ask them, I'd like a million fish, and they would charge you and they'd give them to you, and you could then do whatever you wanted with them. The Murray-Darling's an interesting example. There are a whole range of species in the Murray-Darling that are either critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, threatened, or restricted. And aquaculture provides the stocks that maintain those fish in that river system, and at the same time for the aquaculture de developments that have spun out of that whole system, because these fish are actually very good species for aquaculture. They're mostly herbivores or omnivores. There are some top-level um, fish there as well. But in 2004, more than 3 million fingerlings were utilised for restocking purposes 
in that area, and they all came from the aquaculture industry. So we were already in a situation where we use aquaculture you know, in the whole restocking restoration area. What will be a little bit more difficult, I think, but worth investigating, is the potential to use aquaculture to restore systems. And you know, the common theme that we heard over the last three talks was that herbivory is a really big problem. But at the same time, we can, and we do, within an aquaculture context, produce herbivores in very large numbers. How we choose to utilise those you know, is a little bit beyond me. It's, I don't think it's my place to make those sorts of decisions, but I do think it's useful to point them out as a tool. I mean, we saw with cod. You know, cod was fished out. There were no cod. The Norwegians decided that cod was very important. So over seven years, they learned how to grow cod, and now they're producing 40,000 tonnes of cod a year in an aquaculture scenario. You know, the pros and cons of that in an ecological context with regards to whether you're feeding them or what you're feeding them with is not the point. The point is that the technology exists within the broader aquaculture community to choose selected species that you may want to use and to turn those into a useful tool or an asset. Um, this comes, the, the rabbit fish idea of this again, this comes from discussions with Dave, so thank you Dave. Um, yeah, these guys are herbivores, they're already cultured in large numbers um, in the Philippines. Um, this is actually a photo of one of my students who went on a, a workshop, um, just brought back. This is a spawning um, Saganus gatatus, which they use as a class exercise to um, you know, learn how to do spawning and culture techniques. The great thing with these things and these fish is that they're actually fantastic to eat as well. So you know, while I'm not advocating the release of millions of fish into the environment, if you did and you didn't want them anymore, they do serve a useful purpose. Likewise with urchins, and again, you know, it would be a controversial thing to suggest that you might want to culture a whole pile of urchins, be it in the Caribbean or, or be it in uh, Southeast Asia or the Pacific, but uh, you can. This is a photo I took when I was in Okinawa two years ago, and they produce this uh, urchin trip, Eustis gratilla, by the hundreds of thousands to millions, um, in a hatchery on land, um, they then proceed to put them on a boat and the boat moves along and they just throw them out the back and they come back a year later and they fish that whole area out. So again, the technology already resist, exists to, to take something like this, utilise it if we see fit, and the end benefit is actually quite positive. If we wanted to take all these things away, we could sell them to the Japanese because Tribunus gratilla has what is called the white urchin, and it's got the highest quality row that uh, is on the market. So, tricky, but doable, if, if we decide, or someone decides to go down that route. Okay, I think corals are the next thing. If you can get rid of all the seaweed, and obviously from Terry's experiment, you know, 10 days is pretty quick and there aren't that many fish around, perhaps you'd want to put something back, or yeah, you'd let natural recruitment occur. But again, just to highlight that the tool for this sort of thing is available, you can use nubbins like this, and this is a, a photo from Fiji where um, corals are produced commercially for the aquarium trade. But there's an alternative option, and that's to look at using larval supply. So actually collecting larvae from the wild or spawning and then deciding what to do with these things. Um, again, it would be... Um, you know, an issue of how to deal with that. But there are people in the room that are much more, more <laughs> sort of versed in these types of approaches, but it, it's a decision of investment to try and make these sorts of things work if somebody decides that they're suitable to do. But there's no doubt that the technology exists to try and intervene if required. Um, you know, there's a site listed species, giant clams in Queen Conk. You know, Again, if we want to start to reintroduce further down the, the, the sorts of species that might be of primary importance within coral reef systems, we can, we do, produce giant clams pretty much at will, um, both at James Cook University and through the South Pacific. Um, likewise, um, and this is very much a business, a business um, sort of um, environment linkage. In Florida now, that, that you're allowed to culture Queen Conk and some of those have to be returned to the wild. 
Um, so there's a distinct possibility when we want to select species that we can culture them, and we can culture quite complicated species as well. So we can close their life cycle. Um, somebody before was talking about um, all of these higher level fish that people want to catch being important. Um, this is a list of fish that are now cultured at the Northern Fisheries Centre in Cairns by Queensland DPINF. Um, the latter two are still formative, but both this one in particular is cultured in Southeast Asia now. So, you know, if we wanted to reintroduce at a higher level, not necessarily these species, but we can choose things that might want to be reintroduced, and we have the technology to go through that hatchery phase and produce them in very large numbers if deemed appropriate to reintroduce them. I think seaweeds have been done to death. I really feel sorry for them. I love seaweeds, and I'm particularly fond of calerpas. Seaweeds are important, and they're a natural part of a reef ecosystem, just not lots of sargassum. Um, I've put this up here because you know, if we want the fill-in stuff, the pretty ornamental fish, the ornamental crustaceans, the crabs, all of the larger crustaceans, and the seaweeds, we also have the technology within an aquaculture context to produce them on a, on a scale that might be useful. So, this is the important part. I don't think that we can go out and introduce things willy-nilly, that's pretty obvious. But we do have a toolbox that will allow us to make decisions about what we can and can't use in those introductions. And that's really the job of the coral reef scientists and the ecologists, not the aquaculturists. But I think there's a very nice interaction that can be had between the coral reef scientists and the aquaculture community, which includes uh, you know, the business community, because I think things on a large scale are really where um, aquaculture can, can, can contribute. Um, you, know, you, you might have managed sequential introductions. You know, endemic species, where we saw that most of the little fish occur everywhere anyway, and you have to be very careful how you do all these things. There's no question about that. And you know, they might facilitate natural restoration. So. I'm going to get in on time. We can all have a beer. I think that's very important. It's been a long but informative day. I really think there is a role for aquaculture and ecosystem restoration. I'm not going to stick my neck out and say exactly what I think that is, although you know, I have an opinion. Um, the nice thing is that there would be distinct economic benefits associated with that. So you, you're trying to get a win-win situation, particularly when you're looking at communities that aren't Australian. You're moving into areas where um, you need to create an economic balance between changing things and giving people an opportunity. You can develop controlled restocking. You can have the spin-off of further aquaculture development if that's an appropriate thing to do, and that's a business society environment issue. But it does provide the opportunity for community development. You can engage people in these types of activities. And if you look at marine parks now and marine protected areas being, being designed, they all have an aquaculture component in them. It might be extractive like, like pearls, but many of them have that in Africa and in other nations simply because that links in an ownership and a responsibility and an economic benefit from those areas. And I think aquaculture can contribute in an unusual way that we probably don't normally think about to a long-term sustainability with reefs. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, we have some time for questions. We're supposed to...